Complicated, an Abraxian Wars Story, written by Daria Simon, story by David Edward, copyright Frequency 99, imprint Frequency 99, Ocala, Florida, USA, all rights reserved. This is a work of fiction. Any resemblance to actual events or persons, living or dead, is entirely coincidental. Author's note, this story takes place between the stories MDF Reason and End of Reason. Chapter 1, Wartech. Commander Thalia pulled back on the control, then pushed it forward and left as hard as she could. Left, right, left, maneuvering the small craft around space debris and incoming ordnance. She had the craft near its top speed, pushing the machine with all it could handle. The giant Abraxian war cruiser had decelerated into the battle at the last moment, just as the Baetorians switched sides, causing massive amounts of panic and confusion. It had clearly all been coordinated. Her squadron was comprised of elite Baetorians. One moment following her orders and making easy work of the old tech ships, the next launching missiles at her and turning the tides of the battle for the Abraxians. The Baetorians were the key to the conflict, and damn if they didn't just make things a lot more complicated. Her combat shields flashed and complained at the bombardment. She avoided several missiles with her quick maneuvers, but there were just too many. The sky was filled with Baetorian treachery. Commander! Magnus's voice ranged through her comms, directly into her headset. She tried to respond, but her craft shook too violently from the individual impacts. The noise of the alarms and the flashing damage panel started to create a strobing effect. She was trying to focus on her global systems panel when everything went dark, then blinding white light, then dark again. Chapter 2. A Rough Landing Thalia woke up with a splitting headache and a broken rib. The emergency pod she escaped in had survived the 8,000 degrees journey through Verkfar's atmosphere. The parachute system had failed. The craft folded like an empty rations bag on impact. The interior was a nest of wires and twisted metal, she stretched cautiously, testing the functioning of her tender limbs. She stared out through a hole in the wall at a foggy swamp in an unknown world. It was a miracle of luck that she was still breathing at all, given the force of the crash. She winced as she inhaled. Each movement of her chest was agony. The suit was healing itself slowly, dispersing quick metal to fix the tears and ruptures caused by the impact. But it couldn't heal Thalia's human body. She felt a pain like a hot iron held against her rib when she stretched. She knew it was broken. Magnus, she ventured, white noise and static. She reached down to check the global systems panel on her forearm. Red warnings for physical damage to the helmet, collar, torso, arms and legs. An air system was breached. Hydraulics and movement assist were working. Communications were online. Why the static then? If the communications system was undamaged, that meant there was only one real possibility. Someone else had landed on Verk far close by, and they were projecting a jamming signal. So much for a quick rescue. As she dropped out of the twisted wreckage, the heavy suit sank into a swamp of waist-high, murky brown water. Strange grey and blue vegetation as far as she could see. Looking up, Thalia saw a fireworks show of comets. Each one was a falling ship, burning up in the atmosphere. Either that, or an escape pod like the one he had arrived in. The battle was still going on in the space surrounding the planet Verk Far. The battleships were visible like extra moons in the sky, while the fighters looked like moving stars in the cold distance. Thalia wondered how many of those pretty comets falling in the still blue night were her fellow Machaeans, and how many were Baetorians. Trying the radio again, she could hear only static. She wondered who was behind the jamming signal. Am I being jammed by friendly sources, or one of them? She doubled over as a wave of pain engulfed her. Her injuries were severe, but she was well aware that it was more dangerous to remain still than move at this point. If someone nefarious was jamming her, they were likely close by. Close enough to have seen the explosive impact of the emergency pod's landing, which also meant that they would soon be arriving to investigate. She could not count on that being one of her own. You're still alive, she reminded herself. Get moving. An alarm began going off inside the suit. Thalia lifted her arm to see the global systems panel above the dark swamp water. Wiping off the panel with her free hand, she saw a red circle around her legs and torso with a green droplet, a metallic infection. Of course, the swamp was full of bacteria that fed on metals, 
rapidly oxidating them to facilitate a reproductive process. Those particular bacteria were not biophagic and would not harm her. They would, however, dissolve the shield that protected her from almost two dozen other types of flesh-eating bacteria that would happily devour her, slowly causing death that would make being burned alive in lava seem inviting. The swamp was toxic. She wasn't sure how long she had before the bacteria ate through the metal suit, but she knew it wouldn't be more than a few days, and functioning would start to drop off long before that. Magnius, she asked again, hopefully. Static. Still jammed. The battle had gone badly from the start with poor and possibly compromised intelligence, leading to tactical errors that caused massive losses for the Machian fleet. Initial Machian surveillance showed a small convoy of Baetorian forces in the space around Verkfa. The predominant feeling among intelligence experts at the time was that they were repairing and resting before rejoining several other contingents to launch an attack. The opportunity was too good to pass up. Machian leadership seized the chance to wipe out a Baetorian fighting force with few losses. There were high-level discussions above even Thalias's rank about options and possibilities. The source of information about the whereabouts of Baetorian cruisers and their movement capabilities was understandably kept secret. When the larger Machian forces arrived, it was evident that the Baetorians knew they were coming in advance. The small fleet used evasive maneuvers to minimize losses for almost eight hours before the heavy Baetorian cruisers arrived. By that time, the Machian forces found themselves in virtually the opposite of the situation they had been hoping for. They were outnumbered and vulnerable. Thalia spent the first hours of the frenetic battle commanding others before it became necessary to strap into a fighter herself. Still delivering orders to a pack that followed her, she started scrapping with Baetorian gunships in and out of the atmosphere above Verkfar. She couldn't actually remember getting hit. The last thing that her hazy, likely concussed brain could recall was being just above the atmosphere and targeting a mid-sized ship with long-range missiles. She couldn't even remember activating the escape pod. She wondered how many of her squad were still up there in the night sky without food or sleep or rest for hours and hours, continuing to fight for their lives and their moon. She hoped their spirits were up and they were headed for victory, but some part of her worried that they were only drawing out an inevitable loss. As Thalia waded through the deep swamp water, cutting the dense vegetation with an arm bracing in order to clear a path, she thought back to her first survival training course at the academy. The instructor was a balding old man with a thousand-yard stare and a thin moustache who spoke in a soft, low voice. He was famous for having lived eight years alone in isolation on the planet Goom in the inner system after crash-landing there in a rare navigation failure. He had survived for innumerable days and nights in sweltering temperatures with nothing but algae and bitter herbs and acidic insects to eat. His face and body were still scarred from the sandstorms. You will learn, he said, that nothing matters except breathing. Not your mother or your father or your wife or your husband or your children or yourself. Not your childhood and not your future. Even your empty stomach and your aching bones are not important compared to the breath. Nothing matters but living, right now, not later. Nothing is real except that next delicious breath. That didn't mean anything to her at the time. It seemed like an odd speech from a damaged eccentric, but his words became bitterly real to her when they started the training exercises. In the Machian military, training frequently killed people, and several of Thalia's classmates breathed in their last delicious breaths while trying to find something to eat in the freezing cold. The exercise started with a beating, a hailstorm of fists and kicks. In real life, isolation almost always started with a beating. Thalia was nearly 20 years old when she did the academy survival exercise. She chose to be a soldier and asked to take the course. She had taken her fair share of beatings before that, and she had experience on both sides of the outcome. They left her slumped against a tree in the forest with blood running down her throat and coating her lips and both her eyes swollen shut. She had nothing to help her survive but her clothes and a child's penknife. Those were the worst days of humid cold. 
the kind of days when the wind of the cold Machaean plains accelerated into tornadoes that pulled at the thin trees and sapped any living body of warmth. Thalia didn't sleep for almost a week. She started phasing in and out, too tired to sleep and too hungry to care. She survived eating small rodents found in deep burrows and sewing their skins together to make blankets the size of face cloths to warm her hands as makeshift mittens. She moved her body constantly to keep warm and practiced the breathing techniques she had been taught to maintain her focus. She protected herself from the wind in a crevice between two rocks where she could feel insects crawling over her. In the absence of any joy or comfort, immersed in the suffering of deprivation that she could never have understood beforehand, Thalia saw the truth of the instructor's words with beautiful clarity. Nothing mattered. All of the military accolades she had ever dreamed of, all of the heart-wrenching drama of her life up until that point, even her deepest feelings for the people she loved, all seemed like something from a hollow projection about someone else's life. They were simply ideas, mental fabrications. What was real was her next breath, in and out, still alive still alive. The important thing is your will to live, the instructor had told them. It's easier than you think to die. As soon as the thought enters your mind, you begin to plan it. You visualize your own death and start to prepare yourself for it. You must never allow those thoughts to enter your mind. The idea of your death must seem as absurd to you as the universe collapsing in an instant to nothing. Those things are the same. Your death should seem as distant as the food you want to eat and the arms of the people you love. It should be an idea so foreign to you that you cannot comprehend its meaning. Make everything in your mind about embracing the meager thread of life you have, about taking that next breath, about hearing your heart continue to beat. Know that your pain and hunger and sadness and desperation mean only one thing. You are still alive, and therefore you are still victorious. If you still want that next breath, if you yearn for it, you have everything you need to survive. Don't ever get lost in the world of ideas because the reality of your next breath is straightforward. It will happen or it will not, for reasons that are knowable and changeable. Thalia found a small hill of mud and grass that rose above the bog. This was where she decided to launch the beacon from. A standard distress signal would alert McKeon forces of her exact location. She had a beacon embedded in her suit but it didn't have the kind of signal range necessary to break through the atmosphere. To really get the kind of attention she wanted to get, she needed something orders of magnitude more powerful. A beacon project the launcher looked like a giant grey tube with an extensive base that needed to be anchored into something solid. If the distress beacon worked, and the Mayan forces were not preoccupied with fighting for their own lives, it was possible that a rescue ship would be sent within the hour. Thalia's rank meant that she was considered valuable enough to merit that kind of risk and expenditure, and she knew it. She planted the base of the beacon launcher in the mud and stomped down on the corners as hard as she could to anchor it. It still looked a little wobbly, but she knew she couldn't be too picky. She quickly checked the components to make sure none of them were damaged and then stepped back and entered the code in her suit. The beacon ignited and blasted straight up into the atmosphere like a rocket. Thalia's eyes followed it as it grew smaller and smaller, propelled higher and higher into the atmosphere. Gunfire cut through the swamp. Thalia's ears rang, heavy weapons were being fired very close by. She dropped to the ground and looked up in time to see the beacon projectile cut apart. A cloud of debris dispersed in the air as it was shot to pieces. Someone had seen her cry for help and ended it. Baetorians, Thalia thought. Just what I need right now. Chapter 3. Close Encounters Thalia started moving immediately away from the beacon launch site. She knew that any Baetorians nearby would be able to triangulate the trajectory and find her quickly. She waded through the swamp, wincing as her broken rib reminded her of the damage she had sustained in the crash. She wondered if she was bleeding internally. The lifeform tracker on her suit started to spit out static at the same time as Thalia noticed the Baetorian hacking its way through the dense foliage in the swamp ahead of her. The machinery was malfunctioning, but her eyes were working fine. 
As soon as she saw the gleam of the metal suit in the darkness, she dropped below the surface of the swamp water, rendering herself invisible but blind. That shiny metal suit looked different than the average Baetorian shock trooper. It was definitely a multi-planetary alloy. It was also emblazoned with an insignia that Thalia did not immediately recognize, which could only indicate rank. She caught a glimpse of it for just a second before she plunged beneath the surface of the water. She had a finite supply of stored oxygen in the suit. Still, it was more than enough to move underwater to a better position. She swam down where she could touch the shifting mud. By staying close to the bottom, she avoided making any disturbance in the water that would alert the Baetorian. You probably have a concussion, she admitted to herself. But try to think about this tactically. Attack first. That was the maxim she had been taught. Don't relegate yourself to defense. Strike first when you can, especially when you are unseen and have the element of surprise. In this case, however, that would be bad advice. Thalia was wounded. The pain in her torso was near constant, and it would undoubtedly encumber her in either hand-to-hand -hand or armed combat. She had a sidearm, but firing a shot would give away her position and set in motion a chain of events that could quickly get out of control. She decided to swim away. She stayed at the bottom until she was sure that she had covered a decent amount of ground and distanced herself from the enemy. She emerged in a tangle of vegetation, not making it as far as she had hoped. The movement of the Baetorian was still visible, lumbering past and looking from side to side, searching for her. It was at least two heads taller than her and 200 pounds heavier. It carried a heavy gun and cut through the vegetation with an arm bracing similar to Thalia's Machi version. It was not outfitted in poorly maintained, scrapped together old tech like some of the shock troops she had seen. Thalia had been right. Its ornate armor indicated rank. Its large shoulder plates were red and emblazoned with an ornate design. It wore a large, elongated and aerodynamic helmet. Dull lights emanated from internal displays. When the Baetorian turned, Thalia noticed the insignia on its arm. It glowed even when it was submerged in the brown water. The Baetorian turned and looked directly at her. Thalia? The voice came from inside her suit, from within the privileged Machione communications channel. Her name was pronounced with a Baetorian accent. How was that possible? Thalia? The voice asked again. Is that you? She froze. She said nothing and stayed exactly still where she was in the midst of the vegetation. The Baetorian lifted its weapon and aimed directly at her. The laser sight traced over her eyes. Thalia dropped beneath the water as fast as she could, diving to the muddy bottom. Her broken rib sent a sharp, jabbing pain throughout her neck and back as she forced her slender body to contort itself and change direction underwater. The pain almost forced the air out of her lungs. The shots ripped through the surface of the water. She felt several hits to her back and her legs. She didn't stop to think. She kept swimming as fast as she could. Suddenly, the Baetorian commander grabbed her from the water by her leg like a fish. She dangled upside down for a brief instant, disoriented, while it raised its razor-sharp arm bracing to decapitate her. Thalaya didn't have time to think. Her body remembered her training. Her abdominal muscles lifted her quickly. A sit-up that saved her from the slash meant to remove her head while her side radiated blinding white-hot pain at the intense movement. She lashed out with her own arm bracing at the hand gripping her leg. The sudden impact caused the Baetorian to drop her and she splashed below the murky brown water. Submerged, they struggled blind. She stabbed at the lights she could see in the darkness and moved back as quickly as she could. There was no training for this. No one taught her to fight while injured, blindly submerged in dark swamp water. Her instincts carried her. She knew she had landed a blow when she felt her arm bracing hit resistance. She heard the Baetorian scream even through its suit and the sound of the sloshing swamp water. She swam away as fast as she could. As a soldier, she didn't have much experience with retreat. In particular, in the McCann military, it was considered better to fight to the death than to flee. In this case, Thalia wasn't thinking about honor. She thought about her next breath. She wanted to live. There was only enough time to do what needed to be done. The Baetorian had done further damage to her already wrecked suit. 
She just hoped that the inner layer hadn't been breached, letting in the flesh-eating bacteria. The first sign would be a slight itch, and it would already be too late by that time. She swam until her oxygen was almost gone. Then she waited at the muddy bottom for even longer until she was sure it was safe to emerge. The stillness was oddly calming. She listened to her heartbeat, pumping blood through her living body. She inhaled, in and out, precious breaths. She knew she was still alive. She knew she wanted to live. When she lifted her head above water, she was alone. There was nothing in any direction except featureless swamp, mushrooms, and vegetation. Thalia stood up and winced as the pain racked through her. She had been hurt even worse. And if she knew anything for sure, it was the commander who knew her name was still out there, looking for her. A new mystery, and a dangerous one at that. The Baetorians were not known for letting their enemies escape. Chapter 4. Assumptions. Thalia allowed herself to rest, but not to sleep. She had a concussion from the crash, and taking a nap at this point meant taking a chance on not waking up again. Her muscles begged for deep rest. Her mind was fogged with exhaustion. She knew that sleep could be the same as death. There was no time. She was being hunted. Her suit was slowly being dissolved by metal-eating bacteria. After climbing one of the many-limbed mushroom-like trees, she allowed herself to carefully remove the components of her suit one by one and check for damage. She found dings, dents, and erosion, but nothing had penetrated the inner layer of the suit. She counted herself lucky. It was not her combat proficiency, but the sheer luck that had prevented the Baetorian commander's blade from penetrating her armor. That encounter had been much too close. Sleep was off limits, unfortunately, but Thalia knew that at least she could strengthen herself by eating. Many things crawled and skittered around her in the swamp. She wasn't sure which were edible, but it had been almost 48 hours since she had eaten in the mess hall before the battle. Her growling stomach was more than a sign of discomfort. It was an indication that she was growing weaker, hour by hour. She adopted the same hunting technique she had used as a girl on Machi when they wanted to steal fish from the farms. She hovered over the water in a state of resolute readiness, not moving at all. When she noticed a bubble pop on the surface or the slightest disturbance in the water, she stabbed down forcefully with her arm bracing until it hit the muddy bottom, hopefully skewering something. She waited for three hours and stabbed 46 times before she caught something. A long, worm-like creature writhed, impaled on the blade. Thalia cut it to pieces and examined the flesh. It was green and stringy, like that of an insect. She reached into a side pouch and removed a sprayer with disinfectant. It wasn't a permanent solution against the biology of the swamp. Still, it was designed to allow for some temporary safety in an environment like this one. She sprayed her suit, hands, and the area around her helmet seal. She then carefully removed her helmet and took a cautious breath of the atmosphere on Verkfa. It was not so different from that of Mashi, with an appropriate mix of nitrogen and oxygen for the Machayan race to breathe, except that due to a high sulfur and methane content, everything smelled like an eggy fart. She removed her gloves. She couldn't help but feel naked and uncomfortable when she heard the click of the release. She would have preferred to stay protected, but she needed the use of her bare hands. She touched the flesh first to make sure it wasn't actively corrosive. It felt spongy. After a few moments without feeling any stinging sensation, she was sure it wasn't burning her skin. That didn't mean it was safe to eat, but without any way of knowing and desperate for nutrition, Thalia took a risk. She sliced a thin layer of the worm and pressed it to her lips. Pretend it's fish, she thought to herself. She chewed and swallowed. The texture was spongy and stringy. It tasted like grass, fish, and vomit. She suppressed a gag reflex and took another bite. She did none of this for pleasure. She did it because she needed to keep moving. She did it because she knew that she would need the strength to flee and to kill. What would Magnius do right now? She wondered. It seemed almost silly to imagine her superior officer with her, eating a meal of disgusting worms and fleeing from enemies in the water. It was hard to imagine Magnius running away from anything. Yet she knew deep down that Magnius would do exactly what she was doing. 
he would do whatever was necessary to survive and to be victorious. When forced to choose between pride and survival, she was certain which he would choose, and she respected him for it. In this, as in all things, she sought to learn from him. Thalia remembered the day she had challenged Magnius for his rank. At that point, she was a lieutenant, and she had already won several challenges and defended her own rank against several more. She was younger then, ambitious and arrogant. Still, she had shown her superior officer the proper respect by waiting until they were in port, rather than on a mission. She presented him the challenge on deck, in public, as decorum required. Really? He had responded, raising an eyebrow. That had hurt more than anything. He seemed surprised that she would challenge him. Had he never considered her a potential adversary? Yes, sir, said Thalia. Tomorrow, said Magnius, returning his attention almost immediately to the blueprints he was reviewing. With a dismissive hand, he had waved her away. Young Thalia had been arrogant, but she had never been stupid. She thought she saw a weakness in Magnius that no one else perceived. He was extremely right-handed and weak on his left-hand side, she thought. When she watched him fight challengers, she saw openings they were not taking. Magnus was also getting older. His footwork looked unsteady sometimes. She devised a tactical plan to get Magnus moving on his right side with an initial melee attack on that side, feign retreat, and then deliver an overwhelming blow to his left side, incapacitating him. Then she planned to take his head off his shoulders. When tomorrow finally came, both Thalia and Magnus were stripped to the waist and equipped with blades in front of the cheering ranks. She felt confident. Magnus nodded to her in respect, and she nodded back and then waved to start the fight. Magnus came at her right away. She dodged the first blow. His momentum carried him forward. She perceived a half stumble. Feeling confident, she brought the blade against his unprotected left-hand side. Magnus quickly shifted his stance, a small move that blocked her blade with the back of his own. She had expected that blow to land. Her youth and inexperience in fighting truly dangerous opponents was her undoing. She wasn't ready when her attack didn't land true. Ironically, dedicating all of her strength to that attack left her own left side open. She whirled right to avoid a counter blow and then ducked to avoid a potentially decapitating roundhouse strike. She was on the defensive, she tried to kick out Magnus's feet, thinking he was a little unstable. He quickly stepped right and kicked her in the face. She saw stars. Her vision blurred as she scrambled to get back up, but his blade was already pointed at her chest by that time. Magnus stepped on her neck, pressing her harder and harder into the ground. The crowd cheered. They called for her blood. Magnus smiled as he looked at the audience who were out of control with bloodlust and drunk on both liquor and excitement. Thalia closed her eyes and prepared to die. She was a soldier. She knew what was at stake. She would not be overwhelmed by grief. She would not cling too desperately to a life that was already no longer hers. Magnus smiled down at her. Do it, she mouthed. He looked around at the crowd again. They were throwing pieces of armor into the ring throwing food and drinks, and jeering at her. They were almost out of control, impatient for the bloody conclusion. Magnus raised a fist to silence them, and there was silence. Wordlessly, Magnus got down onto the ground. He pulled Thalia's blade away from her before throwing his own to the side, also. The crowd watched silently in fascination. He grabbed her neck with something like delicacy, and then hit her as hard as he could in the face. He hit her again, and again, and again, until all she could feel was pain, and all she could taste was the bitter copper of her own blood in her throat. She did not remember his victory, or the half-disappointed cheers of the bloodthirsty soldiers who had been hoping for a killing. They told her about that later. Magnus had broken both her arms and left her choking on the floor. He had toweled her blood off his chest and left the arena without any kind of celebration. Later, he came to visit her in the infirmary. She was still breathing through a tube then, with casts on most of her limbs. At ease, he said, confused by her attempt to salute. He pulled up a chair to sit beside her hospital bed. I hope you have no ill will, he said. It didn't have to be said. She had been the challenger, so the injuries she had sustained were her own responsibility. Magnus was obligated to defend himself and would have been well within his rights to kill her. 
Thalia made an effort to turn her neck to indicate that she had no ill will. Good. Do you know why I spared you? She couldn't speak, but her eyes communicated that she had no idea why she was still alive. Magnus leaned down to whisper to her, You saw a weakness, and you thought I wasn't aware of it. I know I am slow on my left side. That's why I work on it. You're smart. You just made a wrong assumption, and you weren't strong enough or fast enough this time. Thalia made an effort to nod. You're smart, and you're a good soldier. You have potential. But if you want to work with me and rise in my ranks, you will need to be smarter, faster, and make fewer assumptions. Thalia nodded. Magnus got up and put the chair back where it had been. He was finished. Oh, he added before leaving, if you ever re-challenge me, you won't be so lucky. Be sure next time, or it will be your last. Thalia finished her meal of worm meat while sitting in a fungal tree above the placid surface of the watery swamp. She listened closely for any sound coming from the forest. Her lights were turned off, and everything was black. If Magnus were here, she thought, he would be planning. Not sitting in a tree, waiting to be found. She put her suit back together and checked all of the locks and seals before dipping into the dark water and wading into the unknown. Without any kind of map or access to satellite topography or tracking, and unable to run lifeform scans due to damaged equipment, she was hunting prey that she wasn't even sure she could bring down. The last confrontation had gone badly for her. The Baetorian commander was bigger, stronger, and better equipped than her. She had almost no advantage in this situation. Looking through the darkness, she saw multiple lights bobbing through the water like distant fireflies. She knew if they were Makayan, she would have received a communication. The Baetorian commander had received reinforcements. They were sweeping the area for her. This is the last thing I need, she thought. Chapter 5. In Force. As Thalia moved to escape the dragnet of Baetorian shock troops, she heard a voice coming through her communicator. It was static at first. She expected a Makayan voice, but when words came through clearly, they were in the oddly accented and lispy Baetorian dialect. Commander Thalia, we know who you are, and we have a message for you. She didn't slow her escape, but she did feel an odd panic at hearing her name broadcast again through her own hijacked communications system. How did the Baetorians get the wavelength and the codes right? How were they able to broadcast on a channel that should only be available to Makians? Commander Thalia, your tactical skills have been noticed by the Baetorian forces. You will be spared and given a ranking command in the Baetorian fleet if you surrender now. There is no escape. There is no survival without surrender. Thalia cursed them as she swam away. She tried to shut her communications down, but somehow the entire mechanism had been hacked. She couldn't shut it off. Commander Thalia, your superior officer, General Magnus, has already surrendered to the Baetorian forces and is secretly working under our employ. He understands that the survival of the entire luminary system relies on stable governance that the Machians can no longer provide. That's impossible. Magnus would never abandon Mashi or its people. The idea of Magnus surrendering to anyone seemed impossible. It had to be disinformation. Commander Thalia, your own General Magnus led your forces into the ambush. He knew from the beginning that the Baetorian forces would destroy the Machian fleet. He sacrificed your men and your ships for the greater good, knowing that a quick loss here would mean fewer casualties in the long run. You see, his love for Machi and your people compelled him to make a deal. He understands that the Luminary cannot be governed by a band of savage criminals who no longer slaughter each other for rank. Are you not aware of the corruption of the ranks above you? Are you oblivious to the wanton violence in the ranks below you? Thalia had always had complicated feelings about the military to which she had committed her life. She knew there was nepotism and graft. She knew that the highest ranking officers enriched themselves and turned a blind eye to the crimes the foot soldiers inevitably committed. She had been forced to look away from thievery and random violence at times to keep the trust and loyalty of those in her command. Those men and women lived hard lives and risked a lot for Mashi. What was a lost shipment here and there? What did a little bit of corruption hurt? Wasn't it all worth it to protect the luminary system? In Thalia's view, 
what the Baetorians referred to as slaughtering each other for rank, was one of the purest and least corrupt aspects of the Machian defense forces. Whatever else might be said of the institution, it was true that any soldier could challenge any other and that the highest ranking officers were never safe from their subordinates. If money and power occasionally warped the system, it was all set right again in blood. Surrender now and join your General Magnus in the new Baetorian government. Come out with your lights on and your arms raised. You will be spared and rewarded for your wisdom. Thalia could not say that she didn't consider it. She had no idea what else to do. Her suit was slowly being dissolved by metal-eating bacteria. She had a broken rib, at least. She was likely concussed and was heavily outnumbered. She thought about giving up. She had no idea whether the message she had received was telling the truth or trying to deceive her. Usually, she would have rejected it outright, as disinformation intended to make the job of killing her easier. However, she couldn't explain how the Baetorians had access codes to the privileged and encoded Machian communication bands. She didn't know how they knew her name or Magnius's. She still had her suspicions that someone, if not Magnius, had tipped off the Baetorians that an ambush was about to happen. Was it possible that they were right? Was their offer genuine? Was Magnius already working for them? She couldn't be sure, and she didn't want to make assumptions. In her weakened state, mentally and physically, she had difficulty thinking straight. Exhaustion, hunger, and pain were taking their toll on her. She continued wading through the thick swamp, fleeing the searchlights of her Baetorian pursuers. She wondered if she was really on the right side of the conflict, and worried whether she and Magnius were on the same page. I can't do this, she thought. I'm going to die in this swamp unless I get help. If the Baetorians kill me, it will be better than being eaten by flesh-eating bacteria or starving to death. It will be a quick death at least. And there is a possibility that I'll be imprisoned or even given a command. She entertained the thought of giving up, not just because she was confused about the message she was receiving, but because she assumed that the engagement was unwinnable and that if she attempted to fight, her death was already a certainty. Stop it, she thought. Stop thinking like this. She remembered what her survival instructor had taught her. It's easier than you think to die, and as soon as the thought enters your mind, you begin to plan it. You visualize your own death and start to prepare yourself for it. You must never allow those thoughts to enter your mind. She imagined Magnus's face leaned over hers in the infirmary, whispering to her, if you want to work with me and rise in my ranks, you will need to be smarter, faster, and make fewer assumptions. The Baetorian message continued playing in her ears, running endlessly on a loop. Still, Thalia put it out of her mind. She wasn't ready to admit defeat yet. She wouldn't allow thoughts of her own death to motivate her. She was likely concussed and in no state to evaluate intelligence provided by enemy combatants. She resolved to follow her initial instinct and engage with them as though this were all disinformation. That meant nothing had changed. The mission was exactly the same as it had always been. She was tasked with surviving, and in this case, that meant eliminating the enemy nearby. She put aside all of her existential doubts for the moment. She took a deep breath and rested in the space of possibilities. And that is when an idea came to her. The atmosphere smelled like the wrong end of the enlisted laundry, probably because the swamp was full of methane vents. The gas was constantly bubbling to the surface and dispersing into the atmosphere. Thalia kept moving away from the Baetorian searchlights, but as she waded, she disattached several components from her suit without opening the inner layer. She pried off a battery-powered light, an external timer that normally regulated oxygen intake and nitrogen regulation, and a supplemental battery pack that was typically unused, except in emergency cases. Holding the junk in her hands, she continued wading until she found a vent. She couldn't smell the pungent odor because her suit was filtering the air, but she could see the large bubbles rising consistently to the surface like a low-grade boil. Looking behind her, she saw the searchlights. They were catching up. Quickly, she fumbled with the electronics, twisting wires together, she was constructing a simple improvised explosive device. It was pretty pathetic under normal circumstances, 
but she didn't have much to work with. The light worked independently. She started to cut into the battery with her arm bracing to wear down the outer layer. It was tough going, the metal organic bacteria had already dulled the blade to the point that it was useless for combat. That was another piece of equipment she was down. She whittled carefully at the battery, eager to reach the inner, unstable layer, but conscious that cutting too far would cause the battery to explode. She constructed a simple trigger mechanism out of bent metal that would turn when the timer activated and strike the damaged battery. She figured there was about a 50% chance it would actually go off, but she wasn't assuming anything. It would be no loss to her if it failed, except for a few components that were already degrading. But if it worked, it might solve everything. She said a quick prayer and set the timer for eight minutes. She tossed the device into the swamp where the methane vent was bubbling. The bright light faded beneath the surface, but was still clearly visible. Then she waded away as fast as she could until she had cleared some distance, climbed a tree, and focused her internal binoculars on the trap. One of the Baetorians spotted the light. She heard sounds echoing through the darkness as he called to the others. The searchlights converged on the position where she had laid her trap. So far, good, she thought. Checking her own internal timer, she saw that seven minutes had passed. She watched through binoculars as the Baetorian troops clustered in the area. They lifted the light out of the water and examined it together. She watched them hand it back and forth, confused. Eight minutes passed, and nothing happened. It failed, she thought. It didn't work. That's when she saw a little spark. And an instant later, the entire swamp was engulfed in flames. The wildfire spread so quickly that Thalia had to jump from the tree she was perched in to dive into the water and submerge herself. She could hear the screams of the Baetorians as they burned alive in the inferno. The surface of the water was on fire. The air was on fire. Thalia herself was singed, and the temperature inside her suit was temporarily dangerously high before cooling mechanisms brought it down. Entirely submerged in cool water that had been brought almost to the point of boiling. Good, she thought half delirious with exhaustion. That was good. She swam away, satisfied that she wasn't being followed. Chapter 6. A Complicated Killing When Thalia was alone in the darkness, away from the raging wildfire, she heard the Baetorian commander's voice in her ears again. This time it wasn't a recording. She saw that her own mic had been turned on as well. She was immediately conscious that her enemy could hear her every breath and anything she said. Hello Thalia, he said, I am Kakan. Thalia said nothing. I don't hold it against you that you killed my men. You are doing what you've been trained to do. You are a good soldier, and you were clever. I'm going to kill you, Kakan, she whispered into her mic. If you do, said the voice, you will be killing the only person who can help you make sense of this war and your place in it. Why should I believe any of what you're telling me? She asked him. Because you know it's true. You know what the Machian military is like. There is no loyalty in your ranks, no genuine trust and no just cause. There is only violence and graft. This conflict is not about two rival powers. It is about a force of justice versus a band of criminals and you are on the wrong side. What about your sins? Thalia hissed, suddenly defensive of her people despite her own doubts and misgivings. What about the slaughter at Aegea? What about the brutal old tech you use? What about the alliance you have with the Abraxians? You know more than I thought your superiors would tell you, said Kakan, but still only half of the story. Answer the questions, said Thalia. We could both play this game. What about the slaughter of Baetorians in the worlds of the inner system, where our fleet could not protect us? Why do you use combat androids? What about your alliances? I'm tired of this, Kakan. I'm coming to kill you. The Baetorian commander laughed into the static of the communication line. Are you really? I know you are wounded, Thalia. I know your arm bracings are dulled, and your sidearm is degrading just as quickly in the swamp. You have the same problem, said Thalia. More of my troops will be arriving soon, said Kakan. The same can't be said of you. Your side is losing the battle in the sky. Look up if you dare. Try to find the Machian cruisers and gunships. There are fewer and fewer of them every hour. I can't see that from here, said Talia. Ask yourself if it's true. 
Are you on the winning side? I will be, said Talia, eventually. I am giving you one last chance. Follow the path your General Magnius has followed. Save your own life and the lives of countless Machaeans by bringing this conflict to a swift end. Surrender to me now, and we will be off this planet in the hour. We will drink wine tonight. The thought of the taste of wine made Thalia salivate. The idea of being dry and warm was almost too inviting to consider. She wanted this to end, one way or the other. She had been without sleep for too many hours. Her pain was too intense. You turn your lights on, and I'll turn mine on, and let's walk toward each other with our hands up, she said. A ploy for sure. Do you surrender? He asked. I do, said Thalia. I surrender. Enough is enough. I don't know if I can trust you. You'll have to, said Thalia. I am bigger, stronger, and better equipped than you are, Thalia. If you try something, I will be forced to kill you. I would prefer not to. I am trusting you now. Well, there you have it then, nothing to fear, she said. Do I have your word that you will not use your weapons? What good are words between warriors like us, she said. Either I do and will use it, or I don't and will not. Words will not change anything. No, yelled Kukan, showing genuine emotions. I am a Baetorian High Commander. I live by my word. You have surrendered. You will not be harmed. I'm turning on my lights, said Thalia. You have made the right choice, said Kukan. I am turning on my lights as well. Thalia flipped a switch, and her internal lighted dashboard and her external lights came on in a blinding flash. She suddenly felt very conspicuous. She saw the light appear in the distance through the trees. It flickered like a moon, casting light on the surface of the water. She saw the light start to move toward her, and she started to walk toward the light. Thalia could never remember a time when she questioned Magnus's leadership. Of course, she questioned the man from time to time, but not his resolve or ability to command. It was true that he could be brutal. While the Baetorians used cruel-looking old tech, it was Magnus who frequently deployed combat androids indiscriminately to kill enemy forces and any civilians who got in the way. Thalia had watched Magnus order the deaths of soldiers for infractions as minor as excessive drinking on duty or reckless endangerment of fleet property. She had watched him look at a map filled with little dots representing real people and decide to leave dozens or hundreds for dead based on changing battle conditions. But she never questioned the ends, and the higher in rank she rose, she was slowly learning that when it came to war, the end justified the means more often than they did not. Magnius was also ambitious. Thalia recognized this quality in him because it was a quality she shared herself. He had challenged his superiors for rank and had killed them for promotions. His desire to accrue greater power to himself was rivaled only by his willingness to sacrifice others along the way. Was it inconceivable that a tactician like Magnus would make a decision as complicated morally as an alliance with the Baetorians and Abraxians? What was most important to Magnus? Was it the population of Mashi? Was it the safety of the men and women in his command? Where did she, Thalia, rank in his estimation? These were questions she hadn't thought she would be asking herself. When she reached Kakan, she dropped her weapons into the swamp. She watched the lights fade beneath the surface until they were barely visible. She couldn't see Kakan's face, but he kept his guns trained on her. The arm bracings too, he said through her communications. They're too dull to be of use, said Talia. No harm in leaving them behind then, said Kakan. It was hard to argue with that point. She loosened the bolts and released the arm bracings. They fell into the swamp too. Kakan nodded with approval and pointed with the barrel of the gun. Walk, he ordered. What did Magnus tell you, said Thalia, about the plans too? Walk, Kakan ordered again. She raised her hands and began to move through the swamp. She could feel the eyes and the laser sight of the gun on her back as she moved. Without the arm bracings, she had to use her forearms to shove her way through the dense and bizarre foliage in her way. Not so chatty now that we're in person, huh? said Thalia. I'm not stupid, said Kakan. I know exactly how dangerous you are. They walked in silence until they reached a grassy hill above the swamp, where they stopped to rest. Sensing her moment, Thalia kicked him as hard as she could in the face, cracking the clear shielding of his helmet. He turned and fumbled for a weapon, not 
but he had already fallen into the swamp water. He screamed with anger as he lunged back at Thalia. His dulled arm bracing struck her across the face, knocking her helmet and making her dizzy. Idiot, said Kakan. He raised a gun and pointed it between her eyes. I should kill you here. Tell me something. Was your offer of amnesty and rank really a trap the whole time? Was your acceptance of my offer just a ruse? asked Kakan. How did you get my name? asked Thalia. Was it really Magnius? You're in no position to be asking questions, said Kakan. He scratched at his neck. He shook the gun in her face. You're a prisoner. I thought we had a deal, said Thalia. I can't think, said Kakan. He scratched at his neck. His eyes flashed with panic. It itches everywhere. You got swamp water on your skin. You have a couple of minutes, said Talia, before the bacteria really start multiplying and they get into your bloodstream. That's when it starts to get really painful. Help me, said Kakan. He scratched at his neck and his face furiously. Tell me what to do. How did you get access to my communications channel? How did you get my name? They gave it to me in a briefing, said Kakan, confused. What do you want? Did you meet with Magnius? Did you see his face? No, said Kakan. I read about him in briefings. Please help me. It hurts. I'll do whatever you want. It hurts so bad. He was doubled over in pain. Thalia could see that his skin had broken out in sores. The bacteria were eating him from the inside out. There was nothing that could be done at this point. She wished there was more time. She had so many questions for him. She needed to know who had tipped off the Baetorians that the Machian fleet was coming. She wanted to know how they had gotten their hands on the Mashi communicator codes. She wanted to know how he knew her name. However, she could see through the pain in his eyes that her time had already expired. He could barely focus and would not be able to disclose the source of his information or disinformation. Here, said Thalia. Take a seat and take a deep breath. Put the gun down. What do I do? He asked again, his throat grating. He coughed up blood. He collapsed to his knees and put the gun beside him on the ground. Thalia picked up the gun. Kakan groaned and pulled at the collar of his suit, where the helmet had been removed. He writhed on the ground in obvious pain. His face and neck were open wounds. His mouth was open in a silent scream. Take a deep breath, said Thalia. She shot him quickly in the back of the head and kicked the body into the swamp. She tossed the half-dissolved gun into the water after him. Chapter 7 Bad Politics The battle around Verkfar ended in victory for no one. The Baetorians lost some of their best and largest cruisers. They fled in several contingents when some of their key ships began to take severe damage. The Machians were the last to occupy the space, but their losses were more significant. They received waves of reinforcements and still ended the engagement effectively disabled as a fleet. The casualties on both sides were in the thousands. It took the Machian defense forces a total of 77 hours to locate and retrieve Thalia from the surface of Verk Fa using the coded beacon in her suit. She had a concussion and eight broken bones when they found her. She had not slept. She had killed 14 Baetorians, including a ranking captain in the Baetorian army. She was cheered by the crew when she returned to the bridge. She didn't smile, she said nothing. Magnus came to see her as soon as she cleared medical protocols. I'm glad to see you're still with us and comfortable now, he said. You performed admirably under adverse conditions. I need to speak with you, sir, said Thalia. There will be a debriefing in the morning, he said. No, said Thalia. I need to speak with you now. What is it? How did the Baetorians get my name? How did they get yours? I don't know what you mean, said Magnus. Bullshit, said Thalia. She could read the tiniest expressions in his face. At this point, she had been watching him for years. She knew that something cold and silent had come over him. There was something he didn't want her to see, something he didn't want to disclose. That Baetorian commander I killed, he knew things about you. He knew things about us. He shouldn't have known any of that. He knew nothing important, said Magnus. It's an intelligence maneuver. You know that. I'm surprised you fell for it. He didn't fake having the code to my communicator, said Thalia. Ask me what you really want to ask me, said Magnus. Thalia felt more nervous than she had felt since the first time she had challenged Magnus. She hoped that the result this time would be less painful. 
it felt riskier than ever. She took a deep breath. Are you selling information to the Baetorians? She asked. No, said Magnus. Then how? That was disinformation, said Magnus. His voice was low. But there is a mole in the MDF. Someone at the highest level has been working with the Baetorians, and we haven't figured out who that is yet. That's how they lured us into the ambush in the first place. Someone gave them the positions of all of our ships and the codes to our communicators. You suspected me of being a mole? asked Thalia. Me? Of course not. He seemed genuinely surprised that she could even think he did not trust her. I could have died, she said, seeing the hurt and knowing what he meant to her. I knew you would be fine, he said. I can't protect you from everything, but you are always my top priority. Is there anything you wouldn't do to win this war? asked Thalia. Magnus said nothing. His eyes were not angry, but his absence of expression spoke for itself. He was mushy, and he was a soldier just like her. Neither of them had come from wealth or privilege. Both had cut their teeth in the brutal military academies that Mashi invested in to simultaneously educate its soldiers and incarcerate its delinquent youths. Murders in and out of the institution of the military had become commonplace too early in their lives. The habitual and casual distrust of illegal politicking had become a fluent second language to them. Thalia knew that violent physical and psychological cruelty displays were always tactically acceptable. There was nothing Magnus would not do to win this war. That was why she followed him in the first place. Not because he was starry-eyed about his role as a savior to the Mashi, and not because he was a brilliant tactician, although he was both those things, but because he was unequivocal about what would need to be done, and he was completely prepared to do it. She valued that about him. It was a quality she sought to emulate. And, he cared for her. Not the same way she cared for him, but it was more of a bond between the two than most officers had. It wasn't that he didn't care deeply for her. She could see it in his eyes. She could feel it in his presence with her. At the very least, he had invested hundreds or thousands of hours in her professional development as a mentor. She was anything but expendable to him. It was simply that Thalia understood that Magnus's feelings for her would never interfere and sway him to make a tactical mistake. He would do what was best for the mission, what would best achieve the sought-after goals. Her safety and comfort would always be secondary to him. And, she realized, that was why she wanted to please him so badly. That was the thing that set him apart, that made him a natural leader. Magnus frowned. You performed well. Get some rest said Magnus. Tomorrow, we're going to continue looking for the mole. And next time, next time we face a fleet of Abraxian Wartech like this, Thalia, next time, we're raiming the most prominent ship they have, and we'll kill every last one of them with our hands. The end.